Hey, good afternoon, everyone. All this uh, meeting of the New Mexico Museum of Space History Governor's Commission to order. And um, Chris Orwell, uh, maybe just ask you if you would uh, go around and introduce everyone who's here at the meeting today. Um, uh, do you want me to introduce the commissioners as well or leave that to themselves and just introduce the staff and the DCA folks? I think just the staff and the DCA folks and uh, we'll just read the names of the commissioners into the record. Got it. So attending from the staff, uh, we have Sue Taylor, who is the curator um, of the museum. We have Mr. Patrick Moore, who is the uh, chair of the history division. So kind of oversees the uh, Space History Museum. Mr. Johnny Powell um, from the International Space Hall of Fame Foundation. Uh, April James, who is filling in for Sharon today. Um, she works down in the marketing and education department, um, and she will be scribing the meeting today. Uh, Kathy Harper, who is the uh, marketing director um, for the museum, and uh, Warren Eanes is blacked out, um, uh, but he is the IT uh, rep for the museum and uh, uh, all over Zoom meeting guru. So. And my apologies for joining the meeting late. That's understandable. Perfectly okay, Don. Nice to have you here. John, good to see you. I think uh, we also have, uh, we're only missing one commissioner today, and that's uh, Bryce Tappan is not uh, available, but I believe he are, uh, did not uh, indicate he would be here. Um, so the rest of the commission is present. And with that, um, that's where we are called to order. Let me first uh, go right into the agenda item number three, and that is uh, approving the agenda for this meeting. And I do have one change to the agenda, which is just a change of order, uh, not of content. And uh, that is because um, uh, Dr. Churchill has a, a, an engagement which is going to require him to leave a little bit early, and I want to make sure that the Mission Long Range Planning Committee has an opportunity to present their, uh, their subcommittee report. And so if there are no objections, I'd like to move that agenda item 11B um, up to uh, between items 8 and 9, if that is uh, acceptable. I'll move that right. we approve the amended schedule, the amended agenda. Good afternoon. I would just, this is Valerie Joe. I just uh, thought you might want to do just a roll call attendance um, so that you can call, um, so it can just be noted who the members are that are present as we move along. Thank you. Oh, very good. We'll do that now. Uh, we'll start with a roll call attendance and um, we'll start with uh, Chris Churchill. In attendance, aye. Aye. Uh, Rhonda Cross. Here, present. Don Elder. Present. Kimberly Fahey. Present. Jacqueline Fryer. Jacqueline. Present. 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 Uh, Carlos Martinez. Present. James McAteer. Present. Beth O'Leary. Present. Hello, Omeg. Oh, yeah, I'm present. Um, <laughs> yes, sorry, apologies, I'm eating, but that's why. Bye. Bryce Tappan, I believe, is absent today. And I, John Haas, is here. And that is the commission. Okay, now I'll move that we approve the amended agenda. Second. 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 All right, uh, we're still operating virtually, so we'll do a, a roll call vote on adoption of the agenda. Um, Churchill. Approved. Commissioner Cross. Approved. Commissioner Elder. I'll vote aye. Commissioner Fahey. Approved. Commissioner Fryer. Aye. Commissioner Martinez. Aye. Commissioner McAteer. Aye. 
Commissioner O'Leary? Aye. Commissioner Omig? Aye. Commissioner Tappan is absent, and I vote aye. Think you're on mute. Sorry about that. I, no. I don't have any changes. Is there any discussion on changes to the uh, minutes from the meeting of April 30th? I'll move we approve. Do I hear a second? Second. Commissioner Cross. Okay. Um, Roll call vote on accepting the minutes from the meeting of April 30th, 2021. Uh, Commissioner Churchill. Approved. Commissioner Cross. Approved. Commissioner Elder. Approved. Commissioner Fahey. Approved. Commissioner Fryer. Approved. Commissioner Martinez. Approved. Commissioner McAteer. Aye. Commissioner O'Leary? Approved. Commissioner Omig? Uh, aye. And John Haas votes aye. Item number five on our agenda is a report uh, from DCA. I believe we have Patrick with us today. There we go. Thank you, Chairman. And, and, and uh, Members, appreciate seeing everybody today. The Cabinet Secretary extends her apologies at not being here with the uh, reschedule. We had to overlap with the Museum of New Mexico uh, Board of Regents meeting, which is also being held at the same time. And this was by no means that you are less significant, but you had major things to address with them for approval. So uh, they're going to cover for me and I have the privilege of being here with you. Um, there aren't a lot of specific things that I don't, I don't want to steal from any of Chris's thunder, uh, which will be coming, but certainly the most exciting uh, component from the last time we were together is that we are now fully open and operational uh, within the Department of Cultural Affairs. It's been a, was a long 16 months. There's no question in our, our deepest appreciation go to Chris, his staff, and everybody across DCA who managed to both navigate COVID social distancing um, and continuing to do telework up until just uh, what it was at Chris now, a week and a half ago, uh, the 6th of July that we came into play. So all of our uh, operational services are back and functioning, all of our libraries, all of our collections, uh, all those research uh, elements are available for the public to come in who have been uh, unable to come and visit for a long time. Uh, so out through the remainder of this month, the staff is going to get its sea legs across DCA, if you will, on being back next to each other. We know that uh, her challenge is about how are we going to deal with things that were left in refrigerators and that sort of thing. Fortunately, it hasn't happened at Christmas to the best of my knowledge. Uh, but with that, uh, after we get through all of July and August, DCA will return to all in-person uh, public and educational programs. So right now we have not been doing outreach, visiting schools, programs, et cetera. So this will be allowed to bring back the way things were in essence, tours, lectures, classroom visits, on-site uh, activities. And probably most importantly for almost all of our entities is having all of our volunteers will be coming back. Um, we're still navigating, absolutely. So we're still navigating uh, issues of policies about masks and social distancing, but at least we are back fully functioning. And during the month of August, if there are those uh, individuals who are seeking to do an external program, which isn't directly mission related for us uh, at the museum, uh, we can start having conversations about them. And then starting in September, we will resume all non-mission aligned rentals and events that are taking place. So it's, uh, it feels good on behalf of DCA to be coming back into alignment and coming back to what we're doing well. And, I, and again, I had already expressed that, but a great deal of appreciation to Chris. I know he was a little later on getting things back up and running uh, because of the bathroom renovations. And now that, uh, again, not to steal his thunder, but now that we're back to full force, it, it, feels, uh, it feels great to have some normalcy again. So we appreciate it. And hopefully in the not too distant future, you'll make that decision. Uh, we can move back into in-person meetings in the, in the short order. 
So I stand for questions if you have any. Uh, this is uh, John Haas. I have one question. With respect to um, in-person meetings uh, of the commission and uh, specifically, is there any guidance or rules that affects that uh, meeting like that specifically? Um, I think that will, rather than speak, that's not DC as your governor appointed. And I imagine there, there she is. You can probably address that. Uh, thank you, Dollar Joe. i um, being back in to address sort of what those steps might be. But I know if you all want to come and Chris can do it, we can certainly do those meetings. Okay. We'll uh, actually bring that up for discussion later when we talk about scheduling the next meeting, because I think it'd become relevant then. Thank you. All right, any uh, questions or discussion on anything that uh, Patrick Moore has uh, informed us of today? Very good. Thank you, Patrick. Um, and now uh, any uh, comments uh, from the um, International Space Hall of Fame Foundation? Uh, good morning, uh, commissioners, uh, and, and greetings from all the board members from the International Space Hall of Fame Foundation. Uh, we just want to echo uh, the, the DCA sentiment and everyone's sentiment that we are back to and going. Um, I like Patrick's comment about things left in the refrigerator. I looked down at my desk as I actually sat back in my office for a few times, rifled a couple of papers. The biggest crisis de jour was dated 3-15-2020. I thought that was pretty interesting. Uh, and, you know, after that, uh, everything just moves somewhere else. Uh, but anyway, we're back and, and, and we're, we're certainly enjoying that. Uh, we've got some exciting events coming up. Uh, our Trinity uh, visit is already up to 256 registered paid guests. Uh, we're targeting filling six buses for that. Uh, um, and so that we're targeting 320 guests. So we're almost there. And, and so we're really looking forward to that being a big event. And we have uh, a couple of uh, large events coming up in September, a balloon festival and uh, the Comic-Con uh, that we're also going to staff. So uh, uh, the Comic-Con and both of those were actually uh, working in conjunction with the museum and looking forward to just having some uh, a lot of fun in those events and, and meeting a lot of new people. And, and of course, selling a lot of cool kites and gliders and and rockets and, and, and introducing people to space stuff. Uh, so anyway, that's kind of what we have from the foundation right now. And we do look forward as we move, uh, as we've talked uh, uh, and, and met since the last meeting uh, on uh, programs and such that, that we can uh, join together and, and uh, in the long range planning. So we look forward to that. And uh, I'll stand for questions. Any questions for Mr. Powell? Commissioner O'Leary. Uh, Mr. Powell, I became a member of your foundation and uh, I'm pleased to do that. I'm wondering how many other commissioners in this group have now signed up. Just show of hands would be fine. <laughs> it's a worthwhile cause and um, I'm glad that, uh, you know, I'm happy to contribute in some way, but I urge all the other commissioner members, if they haven't done it, it's real easy, you can sign up online. Can, I can too, somebody uh, put uh, this is Paulo here. Can somebody put the link to the membership on the chat? This is on, on my to-do list. So thank you for reminding us all. Thanks. Okay. Well, th thanks, thanks, Beth. I, I I appreciate that. And yes, I did see your membership, and I have seen some of your other memberships. And uh, I hope you guys will be pleased to uh, what you're about to receive in the mail that have signed up. And, and I hope we haven't left anyone out that has. Uh, but uh, we bought a new card printer and we've kind of redesigned our membership card through all of this and, and, and changed some of our methods. So uh, we hope we've sent out a nice little thank you card and you should be getting your membership cards in the mail. Uh, I, I mailed them this morning. They're in the mail. So <laughs> and thank you. Thanks, Johnny. Uh, any other questions for Mr. Powell? April just posted that link in the chat. Yep, there it is. Okay, and I just like to uh, draw to everyone's attention that uh, Commissioner Tappan has joined. So we have a, a full commission present to, right now. Again, my apologies for being a little late. I understand. Thank you. Thank you for joining. Okay, uh, division director's report. Uh, 
Chris. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you all for joining us uh, today. Uh, I am really looking forward to the next meeting, which, as John and I have talked about, uh, should be in person. And we'll just kind of see about the schedule for that one, because that will require travel um, for a lot of folks. Uh, but in any case, uh, it will be very nice to get everybody together um, uh, in person here at the museum. We have a newly renovated front classroom um, that we will be meeting in that's, uh, that's going to be quite nice um, for that uh, for that get together. Um, sent out the report ahead of time, so hopefully everybody got a chance to review that. I'm not going to spend time rehashing it, um, uh, but we'll be open for questions about that. Just wanted to uh, amplify on a couple of things um, in the report and that are continuing to go on right now. Um, first of all, what you heard Johnny talking about with the foundation, with the events coming up, um, we have a very busy September and October, uh, and we actually have more entities coming in and asking us to do things, but we have limited staff, as you probably saw from the report, and so we have to be very careful about that, um, and so we've held off on saying yes to everything. Now, that being said, the weekend of the September 9th to 12th time frame is extremely busy for us because at one time, the foundation and the museum are working together on having a presence at the Balloon Fiesta, the gift shop and the educators doing demonstrations. Same day, we are also at the Comic-Con. We're at the Comic-Con down in El Paso. That's a big market for us. And to use the vernacular, those are our peeps. Um, as far as the uh, people who are attending the, uh, the Comic-Con. And we are going down there. We've got two booths side by side. The gift shop is going to have a presence um, selling items from the shop. And then the museum is going to be next to it. And we're going to be advertising, uh, essentially, the upcoming exhibit being science fiction and science fact, the sci-fi sci-fact exhibit. And we're going to be doing that by taking down some of the items um, from the exhibit, props, uh, costumes, etc. We will actually have staff members. We have permission to do this um, from the uh, from the uh, owners of the uh, the space the suits to put on some of the sci-fi suits from some of the shows and walk around the Comic Con um, uh, advertising the exhibit coming up. So we think that will be very very good um, for us. Now, mind you, the third event that weekend going on at the same time is that the county holds its annual 9-11 commemoration uh, on the museum grounds. And so uh, we will be doing that simultaneously as well. So we're gonna be stretched extremely um, thin at that point in time. And then when we talk about the, um, the Trinity site tour and he mentioned all the buses, normally we have one bus. So we will have an, you know, a, a guide on the bus and a couple of support people that, that go out and make sure that everything is going smoothly. Um, this time we're going to have to have, you know, six guides, six sets of, uh, of uh, people um, uh, assisting on the buses to make sure that we're hurting all of the, of the guests out there. But it's really absolutely amazing um, that, that we have this many people. And I think we actually, in the end, are going to have more people wanting to do it than we have bus space um, uh, after, we, after all is said and done with all of the, uh, the, the reservations coming in. And then wanted to show you, I'm going to click share screen and hopefully this will work. And I get the right photo up. Where am I here? Where is my where are the photos? Show all windows. Ever have that moment where all of a sudden you cannot find where the pictures are? I can see everything else, but not where the photos are. I know I've got them because I'm looking at it right now. Sorry about this. Just give me a second. It's only because you're under pressure, so don't worry about it. There it is. Okay. And there. Hopefully, everybody should be able to see that right now. Can, can everybody see the picture? No, it just came up. Oh, okay. Yeah. Great. Okay. So what you're looking at, I'm just, this is just some of the new exhibits um, that has gone in. This is the uh, Blockhouse window from Blockhouse 5 and 6 with the video running behind it of Alan Shepard's launch. And uh, you can see on the side of the block there, you can see all the 15 layers of glass. That's right at the entrance to the Human Space Flight Gallery. Um, this is adjacent to that looking into the gallery with the new gigantic 30 foot long case that has a myriad of, uh, of artifacts in it dating from the first launches of Gagarin and Shepard all the way up to the commercial space program at the other end. 
crammed into that one case. This is looking from where that case is into the rest of the gallery, so you can kind of see how it's laid out. We have spacesuits there on the right-hand side, a lunar lander simulator in the back. The graphics are not even up for it yet. Um, uh, the two new vaults um, in place, the moon rock is in the closer vault, and then the, uh, the Apollo 17 chronograph, i.e. Jack Schmidt's Omega watch from the surface of the moon is, uh, is in the, uh, the second vault right there. This is just looking inside that big case. You can see some of the, the shuttle and Soviet and uh, uh, ASTP and some of the commercial stuff, models at the end and descriptions. We have a whole display on all the commercial spaceport showing where they are, what they're doing, et cetera. Next to it is a case where we've got one of the calculators that were used by the, um, the human calculators that we know about from the Hidden Figures book and movie. Um, this is where the vault is looking back in towards that big case. So you can kind of see how it's, how it's laid out. And by the way, the moon rock looks absolutely gorgeous inside this vault. Um, it now looks like a totally different rock because the light on it uh, highlights the grains in it and the reflection off of it, 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 it changed color. It went from just looking black to being looking almost silver. Um, there's the lunar lander simulator. Some of our uh, guests enjoying it today. And then we also installed a couple of interactives. This one's not available yet because we're still working on the graphics on the wall behind it. That's the Stargazer telescope. And this one is available right now. It's the Mars Flyer. Um, uh, for anybody who, who knows space, they may recognize that that's a you know, man maneuvering unit um, that we have repainted and redecorated and then added the screens. And they actually fly a mission and recover um, a rover on the surface of Mars. The restrooms, um, uh, uh, you can see the graphics are starting to go in here, even though some of the restrooms are still being worked on. The floor is not done. It's gonna be a darker color um, than that that looks like a lunar surface. Up on the fourth floor, and th that was the second floor. This is up on the fourth floor. Um, uh, and, and this is another one that anybody who knows space knows that that picture doesn't exist for real because the cupola window doesn't look that direction and the incoming spacecraft don't come from that vector. Through the marvels of modern um, uh, technology though, we can make a really good looking photo. Um, uh, so the, the, although the cupola is real, the spacecraft are real, the earth is real, they're not in that combination normally, um, but they are on our wall and it looks really good. So, and then in the Mars restroom, this is the mural, this is the photo that we're gonna use for the mural um, that is gonna be 24 feet long. Uh, inside the uh, men's and the women's uh, uh, restrooms on the on the first floor. And this is the image that was taken not too long ago of Perseverance. Um, and we actually are using the image where it's looking back at the Ingenuity helicopter on the Martian surface. So this is sort of the right picture. It's just the, imagine the, uh, the, the focal piece on the, uh, on the main rover is turned the other direction. This is the classroom um, that has been uh, uh, renovated, carpeted, painted, lights fixed, uh, ceilings. This used to be where our print area and storage uh, rooms were. And so now we are getting it set up for, uh, uh, for classroom and lab operations. And speaking of lab, this is how the lab is starting to look now as things are getting stored, um, put away. We have yet to put the uh, projector and the screen into the lab classroom, but it is usable at this point in time. And in the back of the room are tons of, uh, of storage lockers, et cetera, for all of the materials. Here you see some of that um, uh, as well in the back of the lab classroom. Um, one other thing, uh, we uh, got some uh, publicity this past weekend um, uh, on KOAT. Uh, I joined a panel there with Sid Gutierrez and uh, um, uh, one of the folks from New Mexico Tech. And uh, we were on air for a few hours while um, Virgin Galactic was getting ready to do their launch. Um, and uh, uh, it was interesting to me. And I would just say I was fascinated uh, by how enthusiastic um, the producers, the behind the scenes folks, the camera people, um, the, the, the host uh, of the show, the weatherman, everything, um, they were really, really, really uh, into the launch. And so hopefully that will, that enthusiasm for space, New Mexico space, regional space, et cetera, 
um, will continue. So, and you also saw a lot of media um, uh, on it na on a national and international level, and that will just continue next week uh, with Jeff Bezos launching from Corn Ranch. For for those of you who may not uh, catch the geography where Alamogordo is, it's about two and a half hours for us to drive to Spaceport America, that direction. It's about two and a half hours for us to drive to um, uh, the Blue Origin launch site, the other direction. So we're almost right in between um, uh, those two launch sites. And then just in case um, you hadn't uh, been paying attention to it as well, don't forget that uh, uh, Boeing has got a launch scheduled at the end of this month uh, with a potential landing in early August out at White Sands Space Harbor uh, as well. So a myriad of space things happening um, within just a couple of hours uh, of the museum and in, in one situation uh, within sight of the museum as well. So with that, I will end my report and open up for questions and comments. Thanks, Chris. Uh, are there any, any questions or, or comments for Chris? Beth? Um, well, it's nice to see everything cleaned up and looks great and you can go to the restroom and be on Mars. Uh, <laughs> but uh, I'm wondering if you have uh, planned to highlight any of these new exhibits like the uh, hidden figures and stuff with a series or um, uh, a panel discussion of lectures about the different aspects, because I think that would boost up uh, interest in uh, for example, the hidden figures, just as an example, or Yuri Gagarin, and that, that would create, I think, as you, and the moon rocks, you know, and the telescope, I mean, anything that really, you know, points to or leads to excitement about coming to visit the museum after they go to a, a lecture or a panel discussion. And this could continue with Virgin Galactic and, and Bezos's stuff too. We, there, there, there's a myriad of things that go on. So, so uh, with our online presence, we've been doing those sort of things for the last year and a half. Now that we're going to be able to next month um, start back up with public events, we are going to be kicking back off again our Launchpad Lecture Series, where we talk about those sort of things. Sue has talked about uh, multiple, you know, topics of um, things surrounding the hidden figures and the the women um, in that that situation that were associated. Um, with the paperclip scientists and, and, and a number of things like that. Um, but we just talk about things that are space history that either have an anniversary or an exhibit um, or that somebody on the staff has a specific interest in. We actually do have brought in people from uh, outside agencies as well. We do that once a month. Um, Sue also has uh, behind the scenes curatorial lectures on a quarterly basis. Um, that she does on objects in the collection that aren't on display. Um, so we have those two things going. Um, we have not ever, um, uh, and that has to do with the fact that um, to date, you know, over the nine years that I've been here, we really haven't opened new exhibits. We've been concentrating on the infrastructure. And it's just now that we're starting to work on um, the exhibits. And so we've not had, and, and we didn't really have a chance to do any sort of gala-ish or anything for the human spaceflight gallery open up we just opened it up because the museum was opening up um and so uh you know yes we highlight the things that are in the collection the things that are on display so that people can come and hear about the background on the stories and then go up and take a look at them so i think the bottom line answer is yes wanted to kind of give you the width and breadth of stuff that we're we're already doing oh you're muted I've been attending some Zoom lectures. Roger Lani is former curator at Smithsonian. Uh, several people at the Wilson Institute have uh, presented lectures um, and they're recorded. Now, whether they'd be accessible or available to the museum, it would be great. Uh, Lanius and I worked together and he gave a terrific talk about Von Braun and the conflicted history there. And of course, you know, you, you've, you've got exhibits about that. You've, you've got White Sands right there. Um, so I'm thinking, you know, maybe uh, working towards getting more um, uh, professional lectures either recorded or coming to the museum. And uh, I know John Haas was jumping up and down because he said there was a redstone rocket that he saw. Is that right, John? <laughs> and uh, 
you know, all this stuff is just very exciting. And I think as you create an event, a lecture or whatever around them, it, it makes more people come to the museum to right. see things. I think the bottom line though is what I'm saying is we do that. And we do have people come in to do lectures. We have um, pulled lectures off online and posted them on our sites, uh, a number of them. Kathy and, and April and her team have done that. We've tried to do that where it's been appropriate and where we're allowed to as well, or we just tell people about the link to wherever that lecture is. We've linked to a ton of NASA and the Air and Space Museum um, content over the last 14 months. So yeah, we're, 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 we're doing exactly what you're saying, I think already. Um, and you know, we, you know, with the, the, if you look at the digital report that was in the director's report, you'll see the number of folks that are engaging um, with uh, that, that content. So I, I think there are a number of more questions here, but I, I think what maybe um, one way we can address this is as opportunities arise, um, you know, and you know, new exhibits open and uh, scheduling starts to take place uh, as, as different folks uh, on the commission get involved and uh, can help perhaps make connections or arrange speakers, this can uh, uh, open up some opportunities or options for the museum staff to consider and maybe just leveraging some of the connections that that uh, that uh, commissioners have, and uh, we can we can look into being supportive uh, in that way. So let's uh, appreciate you bringing that up. Uh, let's see. There are several other questions here. We'll start. Uh, James McIntyre, you had your hand up. Uh, thanks, John. Um, thanks, Chris. Um, the as you said, the, the the launch was a big deal locally, nationally, internationally. It was a really really big deal. Um, I was wondering if you can highlight maybe two or three specific ways that we can really ride that wave for as long as we can carry it. Um, Cause it really made such a big impact. Maybe you could even discuss ways you noticed the impact. Like have you had more calls to the museum? Obviously if you'd have been fully open, you would have had a crowd of people coming in, but yeah, did you have more calls, more requests from media schools for visits and then how to, you know, specifically ride that for as long as we can. I don't, you know, what, I, what I don't know that we're gonna see is that it will necessarily drive calls from schools and stuff like that, mainly because the school year really hasn't gotten going yet. So we'll, we won't know about that until um, the school year gets going. Um, and as far as visitation, we'll know when we start seeing, you know, we're probably just starting to see the first results of that now. During 2019, we saw a pretty good uptick because of you know, it was the, the, the 50th anniversary of, of Apollo 11. So what we're hoping now, as you know, the, the media starts to cover a lot more of these, these tourist space flights, um, and these first couple are, are, are big media because of who's flying, specifically the two people um, uh, that, are, that, are, that are highest on that list, the, 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 the owners of the companies, essentially. Um, so we, it, it will be interesting to see. Now, as far as capitalizing, um, yes, we already, A, A, we're in touch with Virgin Galactic and Spaceport America quite a bit. With Virgin Galactic, um, uh, one of the pilots, I'm in, you know, in fact, actually I was texting with her um, uh, uh, the day um, and before and the day of the flight. And we're working to try and now what I call, you know, call artifacts out of the flights. Um, and so um, hopefully, if we can work it out and they go for it, um, Richard Branson's suit and the engine that were used on that flight are what we're going for and trying to get a hold of. Um, when I was at the previous museum that I was at, we actually got a hold of one of the engines from the XPRIZE flights and the trainer they used um, for uh, training for the XPRIZE flights. Sadly, it's now at that museum. I can't get it down here. Um, uh, in any case, though, so so yes, in that respect. And then one of the things that we did want to bring up, um, uh, and and not for voting now, but at least for people to think about, so that at the next meeting, we probably will bring it up for for a vote. But but the the governor's commission, one of the decision making things that that you definitely that you're definitely doing all the time is um, the, uh, the, the inductees into the Hall of Fame and making the recommendation up for the, for the governor's office. Normally what happens is staff puts together a list, recommends that to the commissioners. They review it, potentially make changes, additions, or whatever. So, um, but we would like to do an induction for Richard Branson uh, in May. 
Um, it would seem very appropriate and he would be very likely to attend and do it. Um, it would be a huge fundraiser for the foundation um, state uh, and a big news thing uh, as well. So yeah, we're gonna try and we're gonna try and keep this thing going as long as we can. Some good plans to ride the wave. Um, Paulo, you have a question. Yes, uh, thank you, John. Um, so for the record, I have a, it's not so much a question, it's a comment uh, uh, or to add to the list of the long list of Chris uh, items that he mentioned at, at the beginning of his uh, uh, debriefing. Um, so next week we're launching a, a, class, a NASA um, classroom educator um, workshop with the, in partnership, the New Mexico Speaker in partnership with the museum, uh, working with Tony, uh, Tony Gondola and Kathy. Um, so that will be uh, three different NASA topics that will be addressed for New Mexico educators. And there will be my NASA data, the GLOBE program, astrobiology, um, the commercial group program uh, for NASA Next Gen STEM. So uh, we're excited about that. So uh, thanks uh, to the museum for their help. And uh, this is going to be a virtual uh, workshop PD. And we're hoping next year, next summer, will be in person and we'll bring it to the museum. And we'll have NASA people to work on perhaps on the NASA Next Gen uh, commercial group program, um, virtual reality um, applications that they have so thank you and we're, we're very excited about participating in that one kathy and dave and and uh, tony uh have been working really hard along you know working trying to work with paulo and get everything arranged and so yeah so we're very excited about that <laughs> that would be a good experiment yes uh, th thank you um uh, chris churchill you you have a question yeah, I thank you, John. Again, apologies to everybody that my camera's broken today. Uh, so I just did a little search around YouTube, and I see that there are some videos about the New Mexico Space Museum of History that are hooked up to a channel uh, with the Smithsonian, but there's no channel on YouTube for this museum. Now, as long as that's not disallowed for some reason, people who know YouTube know that it is an amazing vehicle to put together 10 minute, 15 minute shorts that you, the number of videos that could be put there, the playlists that could be created uh, is endless. And you can see that some of these um, can be funded through Patreon and then you can have pro pro very professional productions. You can have a consistent host or hostess who is constantly, uh, I see that we have a post here from Warren. Uh, I guess I missed the YouTube channel. Um, but anyway, I'm talking about developing that YouTube channel, I guess, into something that has some kind of, you know, production value that's consistent, that talks about all these different things, has a recognizable, uh, charismatic host, a production team behind it. And uh, it, could really gather millions of views uh, and spread the museum across the entire globe and highlight New Mexico in the process. So my apologize, apologies, I didn't find that channel and I, I have no idea what the content is. It might be brilliant. So my apologies if I'm uh, knocking on a door which, for which there's already a beautiful landscape, but uh, that was an idea that came to my mind during this discussion. It's pretty, it's pretty well set up and we've got some amazing stuff on there and everybody, you know, the whole staff's been contributing and, and our, we have a common theming, we have, you know, the, the, the visuals are all the intros and outro, you know, we, we have a lot of that. What we don't have, like what you're saying, was a, is a host, um, uh, but a lot of that has to do with the fact that we're really short staffed, um, uh, you know, it's, it's kind of sucky being down here with as few people as we got. Um, when I first came to the museum, um, one of the first things we addressed was staffing levels because the museum was so far down below on the number of staffs compared to some of our sister museums um, because of, of losses and the fact that we couldn't hire new people. We're back at that same level right now. Um, and so, yeah, it's, it's, 
it, 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 it's, it's a little tough for us right at the moment. And, and, and that's something that I think we'll have to take a look at down the road after we kind of build everything back up. That sounds great, Chris. And I'm looking at the channel now and I see that it's developed and I, it makes me so happy to see that it's there. I, I, I was really kind of like, wait, where is that? You know, <laughs> um, but yeah, but um, if we get a chance to chat in person sometime, I'd like to pull out maybe some of my favorite channels just to share some ideas of like what it is like to have where you have a charismatic host that people get to know and become fans of. Um, and uh, it, it really can help. And I know that costs money, but uh, it was an idea that popped up, like I said, during discussion, and I thought I would just share it. Thanks, Chris. Now, charismatic host rules me out, but uh, maybe we can leave, a, uh, maybe we can impress Richard Branson enough. If he comes to town, we can get him to do a five minute segment and that'll, that'll, be, that'll go over well. Okay, any, any more questions uh, or comments um, on the director's report for, uh, for Sorwal? Okay, move on to item number eight, uh, which, is, which is mine. I'll keep my comments brief. I just wanted to go over a couple of things that um, have happened and that I'll, I'll talk more about later. One is um, I, I did have the opportunity uh, and, and uh, uh, Chris was kind enough to host uh, me on another visit to the museum on the 4th of June. Um, the last time I was there, the museum wasn't open. This time it was uh, just barely and under some somewhat restrictive rules. Um, but uh, most of the exhibits were open. Things were looking pretty good. One thing I'll say about one exhibit, uh, before I went there, we had talked uh, in this commission about uh, the, uh, the, the science, uh, science fiction, science fact um, exhibit. And as we were talking about that, I was thinking, well, okay, how's that going to work? And then I went and saw it, and I realized um, how much this connects with people, and people get their initial connection to space through the, this media, and this works. I mean, this is a really great connection, and I didn't see it till I saw it. I just want to point that out uh, in case anybody else was thinking the same thing I was. Uh, that's kind of where I, you know, remember watching uh, what Star Trek back in like 1967, um, and then figuring out from there uh, where my career went. And anyway, a lot of connection there, and I, I think that really works. Um, I also had the opportunity to spend uh, uh, several hours with uh, Johnny Powell and Cliff Hudson over at the foundation. I'm beginning to understand how the foundation works and its relationships with the museum and, and beginning to collect uh, some ideas on how we can, as a commission, support their mission and bring opportunities uh, to the foundation and, and to uh, its mission of providing support to the museum. Um, that, was, that was a nice opportunity. I appreciate you folks uh, hosting me there for, uh, for the afternoon and, and letting me in on how things work and, and, how, and how you're in a, in a process of changing. Uh, one of the things I'll, I'll point out to the, to the rest of the commission, I've had some individual conversations uh, with some of you on this, is as the museum transitions from you know, this focus on infrastructure to a focus on its future education, outreach, uh, exhibits, its collections, and public engagement, um, so, so too is the, um, uh, is the foundation uh, you know, re reorganizing its agreements, uh, operating agreements with the state, and uh, renewing its, its relationship with the museum and how it will move forward uh, together. And, and as I've said, obviously before, we have a largely new commission. And uh, so there's a lot of new here and a lot of change going on. And in, in my mind, it's, it's all good. And there's a lot of opportunity here. So um, I, it was nice to go there and see that. And I will pitch once again that anybody that can make it there um, outside of a committee meeting, please go and see for yourselves. It is really a worthwhile uh, way to spend a, an afternoon. Um, let's see, uh, we'll talk in a little bit about um, uh, some additions to committees. 
Uh, I'll save those comments for that part of the agenda item. And then the last thing I'll, I'll just say also, which we'll bring up uh, later when we talk about future schedule is I, I do know that we have a, a meeting on our schedule currently for the 27th of August, which is six weeks away. That may seem a little close, but as we get um, down into the latter part of the agenda where we talk about uh, scheduling upcoming meeting dates, um, if we have the opportunity to have a meeting uh, in, in person, a face-to-face -face meeting, uh, that certainly is not too soon uh, to get uh, the commission together, especially if we can combine that with um, uh, a tour of the museum, of the new facilities that are there, of, of, the, of the new building that we're going to, well, the, 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 re, the, the remodeled um, uh, Tombaugh building that we're going to talk about here, here on, uh, on item number uh, uh, 12 and um, to see all that for yourself and how it all fits together. So uh, if we can do that, if we can, uh, if we can try to schedule our next meeting around uh, being able to be uh, in the same room, that would be a, a truly wonderful thing. And I think that's all I wanted to talk about right now uh, in the interest of time. So let's, if there are any questions for me, we can move on to our next item. And I believe oh, this is, I'm John, sorry. John, just for a sec. Um, I just wanted to recognize you for your interview on NPR, KRWG during the Richard Branson's flight. And uh, I think it's nice when uh, people recognize uh, many of the people uh, here uh, in, in what they're doing and then can comment um, to the press. And uh, it's interesting, you know, you didn't, you, you weren't the NASA spokesman, obviously, <laughs> but you certainly uh, added a lot to um, the discussion. And uh, I think it would be nice too, if, if there are press uh, opportunities that you mentioned that we are on the New Mexico Museum of Space History Commission. Thank you, thank you for that. I will say that um, with respect to that interview, which I was pleased to do, um, I was very disappointed in one aspect of that, and is that that was that I went out of my way to specifically uh, tell uh, the folks that were interviewing me that there was this great museum in Alamogordo. They should go there and learn more about all of this stuff, and they cut it out. So um, anyway, I'll, I'll get that in again somehow. <laughs> Thank you for that. Okay, let's see. Uh, this is uh, where we inserted um, um, Dr. Churchill's item, uh, the, and, and this is a, in order to allow him time to get uh, through that discussion point and leave. So uh, before uh, we go on to uh, the key decision schedule, um, I'm going to turn this over to Chris Churchill for the report from the Mission and Long Range Planning Committee. Uh, thank you, John. Um, I'm going to keep our comments brief today um, and say that uh, the meeting, uh, the committee did not meet between now and the last meeting. Um, um, and really, I have two sort of bullets that I'd like to convey from the committee. Uh, one was um, that we'd like to re revisit the idea of uh, seeking feedback on the mission, the vision and core values statements that uh, we had brought up in the previous meeting. And I believe it had been circulated uh, because um, we feel as a committee that um, solidifying those is our sort of our first uh, goal is kind of a gateway to uh, the, the next layers of, of which the community, committee will pursue. And as you can see, um, as being new members on the commission, there's a lot that this committee needs to learn. And so my second bullet was uh, that uh, over the next few months, we'd, we'd like to arrange some meetings with people to um, seek feedback um, or to develop connectivity, to establish continuity and to um, uh, be engaged with the previous uh, subcommittee members or people who have been engaged uh, with the long range uh, mission planning. And so that we can, as a committee, uh, gain that knowledge uh, and become connected to that uh, 
that history. Um, so that would be something that the committee would like to um, conduct uh, as a sort of a first layer uh, uh, is a sort of information and connectivity um, activities. So those are sort of the two bullets I'd just like to say. Um, and then as far as any action items, um, I would like to propose something on the behalf of the committee today, which is um, when, we, when we brought up the uh, mission, vision, and core values statements uh, last time, um, I, didn't, I didn't think we uh, got to the point where we could provide a, a highly structured mechanism for obtaining feedback from the commission. And so I'd like to um, propose uh, a mechanism um, if it's something that's viable. Being new on the com on commission, I'm not sure that this is a viable means for seeking feedback. But our idea was uh, to create a survey that people could fill out. And in order to avoid a quorum, I suppose I could invite each member through their email individually to take the survey. It is not a vote. It is a simple survey that um, it asks you uh, some simple questions, uh, basically provides the mission statement and asks you whether you had any suggestions for improvement or whether you didn't, A or B, multiple choice. And if you had suggestions, it gave you the opportunity to type in a box uh, these, these are my suggestions or these are my concerns. And that's basically all it is, one for the mission statement, one for the vision, and one for the core values. And so I'm just going to uh, open up the desk or open up the floor quickly to see if there's, if that is a reasonable proposition. So um, I guess I'll jump in with a comment here. I, I see that as a, a very reasonable proposition. And, and I think that a, uh, it would even become more valuable if that uh, feedback was uh, solicited a little bit more broadly within the, uh, the context of, of DCA and the staff mm -hmm. of the museum, uh, the, the key stakeholders and, oh. Um, oh. And, and get all of, all of those types of feedback at the same time. And I think that's uh, one of the, the goals that the, uh, the committee has is to, uh, is to understand the, the viewpoints from the various stakeholders. So I, I like that idea. So I think that's great. And I know Chris, you wanna say something. Uh, I think that that can be done if, if uh, somebody just hands me a list of emails, uh, bam, we can send it to whomever it is appropriate to send it to. We can compile all information, and then the committee can has one, you know, one, one um, centralized area of which you can call through all that information and evaluate it. Um, let me just make a quick comment. Sorry, Chris, to step on your talk, but um, I took I was the test monkey for the um, survey, and I think uh, Chris Churchill has done an excellent job, and. Um, looking at what the subcommittee has done, we met for several hours um, before the June 25th meeting, which was canceled, to work on language. And uh, we realized this is a draft and we realized that we need the input as broadly as possible, but, but the structure stands there. And uh, I think that, you know, Chris's idea, it's a simple survey to take. Um, it involves some thinking and maybe uh, broadening our minds as to what is really a good way to go forward to um, to make this. And I, I, I think the whole thing is a mission statement. It's broken into vision and core values, but I think the whole thing is a mission statement. And working with the New Mexico Museum of History, Billy Garrett is doing this too. So it's, it's an important exercise to happen. And I think it will, as well as provide a uh, new, improved, better, uh, different statement, it will bond us together in terms of what, what the goals are and what, the, uh, what the, the future should look like for the museum. So I'd like to applaud Chris for doing this. Thank you, Beth. And any other comments on, um, on this proposal? Okay. 
Um, what I would like to propose to the yeah. commission uh, is, is that uh, we, we allow this to go forward. And I, I would specifically like to request that um, that this uh, feed, because I think the statements are ready to go out to the stakeholders, um, that the, that they go out um, fairly short order, and that uh, we place a relatively short deadline on collecting feedback from stakeholders. And this can be a, a great variety of them. I don't think we necessarily need to limit it. And then, um, and then allow the committee the opportunity to collate all that and find out what that feedback is telling them. Um, uh, Kimberly, you have a, a, a question. Actually, I was going to defer to Chris Orwell. I think he had a comment that, did you have a comment, Chris? Sorry, I was still muted. Um, yeah, and, and you know, just a kind of a, a number of things um, and, that I wanted to kind of address on this one. Um, and, and some of it has to do with procedure. Some of it uh, then has to do with, you know, when we're talking about stakeholders, the, the steps. My recommendation to the, the commission um, based on how, we, how we've done it last time, how I did it at the previous museum, how I've seen other museums do it, how I've seen Lord Cultural do it and things like that. Um, the, and it's, there's a lot of things going on right now. Um, as you heard John saying, you know, we haven't had a chance to meet together. We haven't had a chance to get everybody to the museum to kind of see the width and breadth and history and understanding of what has happened, what's happening and what was, you know, in the, in the plan for, for, for moving forward. And as, you know, it, it kind of as John alluded to as well, there's a significant value to that <laughs> there's a little bit of cart and horse here that I'm concerned about um, where we're jumping into this without all of that being established. And also the way that this has been done in the past and the way that I've always seen it done as far as my museum experience is that, you know, your committee getting together along with, you know, the staff and DCA who are all the ones involved in doing this. It's, it's not just the committee that creates that plan in actuality it's those three entities together, DCA, the museum, and the, and the governor's commission that get together and do this. And we haven't had a chance to really to, to do any of that. And I would love to get the, the collections committee down to the museum anytime in the very near future um, for a meeting to sit down and talk about the procedure for, the, for not just this, but the whole thing, because the whole thing of creating a longer strategic, strategic plan, the first steps for it that we've always gone through were the, the research phase of it, not jumping straight into the mission, vision, and values. It was the research phase. And the research phase was exactly, what, Chris, what you're talking about doing, but you're talking about doing it for one item here, whereas the research phase was meetings and surveys all over the state. Um, and part of that, I'm going to reference the American Alliance of Museums, which we're accredited by. And if we don't do things according to the way they want us to do things, we can lose our accreditation. Um, and, and some of the stuff, I, I could send it out to you all. This is from when I did the accreditation for a museum up in Utah. And it's all of the questions. Uh, but, you know, certain things are staff, volunteers, and governing authority members involved in the strategic planning in some way. Is the planning process inclusive of community members and other relevant stakeholders? And, I mean, there, it, it goes on and on and on. If we are very insular about this one, and I mean insular to the point of just the museum, DCA, and the commission, we can't be that insular. We need to get everybody involved in that research process to find out, really, they're our, they're our customer, what are they interested in? And then we figure out how we best deliver that within what we think is a really great framework. And so I, I, I think that getting a chance to sit down and go over the, the, the plan would be, would be absolutely, a, I think the best first step. Thanks for, uh, thanks for those comments, Chris. I, I, I agree and I, I Personally, I hadn't uh, being uh, involved on the um, with the accreditation of a separate educational program myself. I understand the importance of uh, paying attention to those types of questions, and I hadn't thought about it uh, from my perspective uh, with respect to um, 
uh, muse museum accreditation. So I think that that's some good feedback. Um, what what we can do, and, and I'll, I'll propose this back to Chris Churchill, uh, is uh, we, we can have uh, some further discussion on on being able now that we can do a little bit more meeting, um, getting involved with some of these stakeholders in a face-to-face -face way and learning a little bit more about the process that you're talking about uh, so we can put that in work in a way. Um, I, I don't necessarily have a problem with the type of uh, mechanism that, that Chris Churchill was just mentioning, uh, but perhaps we have to have a closer look at what other stakeholders uh, who they are and how they might want to become involved with this and make sure that that, that is being respected. Um, one reason I don't have a problem saying that right now is there really isn't a, there's not a sense of urgency that this necessarily needs to be completed in a short order. So, you know, whether or not, you know, that gets, you know, approved at the next commission meeting uh, is, is not going to uh, hurt the mission of the, of, of the museum one way or, or another. I see there are several hands up here. So uh, let, me, let me start with uh, Kimberly. Thank you. Um, so I guess what I'm hearing is that coming up with the new mission and core values is supposed to be a collaborative process with the different entities that feed into that. Um, I guess what I would, I'm wondering is, well, can we propose at least using that survey method to at least analyze the current uh, mission to get feedback as to what our stakeholders think of what needs to change and then maybe use that as a starting point to collaborate as to uh, what the next step should be as far as market research and so forth, but at least at the very least figure out who wants to be involved. The, the, let, me, let, let me address that because I think that's, that's absolutely perfect. Yeah, in the surveying. So um, one of the first steps um, was actually is actually stakeholder identification. And so, and that's really the kind of the committee and the staff and a, a DCA rep, if somebody's coming down, participating together to at least go through that first step of who are our stakeholders, identifying all of that. And then the next step is figuring out how do we get that information from them? Is it best to do it with a survey mechanism like this, et cetera, et cetera? Is it best to go out and talk to them? Is it best to have them come to us? Do we do it online? We can do a lot more with Zoom these days. There's, there's myriads of ways, but those first two steps are kind of key to this process. But using the methodology that we're talking about and what Chris has developed is perfect. You know, So that's actually, we really want to do some of that. Surveys are very important um, for, for, for going through this process. That's a good, uh, good point and a good discussion. Um, Beth, I think you had your hand up as well. Yeah. Let's go ahead with Chris's survey. It's designed. We've made the attempt and thoughtfulness of the whole entire subcommittee. I don't know how many other subcommittees have been meeting. Um, and uh, at that point, when uh, we as a subcommittee would collect the responses from this group here, from the museum involved, from DCA, and present it, um, it doesn't affect accreditation to have a discussion about a mission statement. And if we don't start somewhere, we lose focus and we, are, we have become ineffective. So I really am I'm hoping that the work of this subcommittee on the mission statement and long-range planning will be recognized. And that, as John Haas said, in a timely manner, we put this out on 420 and it has not been really brought been brought forth before the entire commission and the staff and DCA. So I'd like to see it done in the next three or four weeks, certainly before the next meeting, so that us as a subcommittee has a chance to look at your responses and that that would be brought forth at a meeting, our next meeting, whether it's in person or on Zoom. I think I'd just like, John, if I'd just like to add that um, if it's possible, um, that the elders, uh, no pun intended, Don, uh, amongst the uh, commission are able to identify all of the stakeholders uh, and all of the individuals who uh, should be incorporated in this so that we're in compliance with the accreditation. 
we can we can cast this net as wide as we want. Um, and then uh, we can compile all the information and we can make that information then available to absolutely everybody who took the survey or who chose not to take the survey, but is a stakeholder. And uh, that can be a, a, a then a um, start to a, to a conversation. Uh, I think we'd see a lot of fresh ideas that, that we could draw from if we could reel it in. Are there any more uh, comments or discussion on, on this point before I jump in with my observations? Okay, so from, from my point of view, my perspective on this is I don't, I don't have any problem uh, conducting uh, the survey. What I, I think I would have a problem with is uh, coming back uh, at the next meeting with a vote to approve um, a statement. I think that what what an initial survey can do, uh, as uh, as Commissioner O'Leary was pointing out, is uh, start the process to identify uh, opinions and stakeholders. And I think uh, one of the questions that could be added to this survey has to do with the identification of of key stakeholders. And uh, and and that can be done in many ways. And if if anyone feels that someone is not uh, has not been identified, or there's a, you know further uh, contacts or study warranted. That is information that can go to the committee. So my preference would be to let the process begin, but not plan on uh, bringing it forward for a vote by the commission for adoption of anything. I think what we need is materials to discuss, and uh, in, in my opinion, having materials to discuss and and spur debate. Um, is a good thing. So I don't have a problem with letting that part of the process work from the point of view of letting the committee gather information. Uh, Commissioner I, just say I, I concur 100%. Um, uh, my apologies, Kimberly, I know you had your hand up. I concur 100%. And I, I, um, I meant to imply much of what you said in my previous comment, I meant to imply much of that. I, I may not have implied it strongly enough. Thanks, Chris. Kimberly? I was just going to say that, you know, I think we certainly should get started and we have a motivated team that will actually sort of go through the data and present it. And I think if we could just use the meetings to sort of provide status, um, that would be, you know, fair to at least see what we're working with and what the progress is. But we should have at least some sort of schedule of what is required to be able to bring this to vote so that at least we know what we're working towards and by when. Yeah, that's a good, that's a good point. And, and in fact, that, that discussion is, is in fact our next agenda item. And, and you are correct on that. Any, any other comments or, or questions? It's not something, it's, this is not something we are voting on, but are, are there any uh, objections to letting the uh, the committee uh, gather information such that it can be brought forward for discussion uh, during subsequent commission meetings, not for decision. Okay. Well, then I, I think that uh, we'll we'll allow the, the the committee to move forward with that with with our our concurrence and uh, and we'll help out how we can. And I would encourage everyone to, to respond to that and in, in your responses to identify stakeholders that perhaps haven't been considered. Uh, and that can be a start for future discussions and future contacts to be made as we, as we move forward on a decision schedule over the course of the next numbers of months, whatever that means. And may okay. I ask two quick, quick, uh, two quick procedural questions. One, um, in identifying stakeholders, is it is it okay for their email address to be included when they're identified? Or, um, because I, the best way to get this to people is you just you just basically send it send them an email link. And um, the other thing is that is there any issue with there being even though it's not an official vote? of any sort, there being some kind of quorum aspect to it if 
it's sent to say too many people on, in one email blast or should it be sent to people individually? Um, I don't necessarily need the answers to all those questions right this moment, but at some point before moving the committee before it moves forward would want to make sure it's acting appropriately. What I will do um, just from the point of view of helping that along is um, I'll, I'll work uh, specifically with, with you, Chris Churchill, and Chris Orwall, and Valerie Joe on any of the questions of process, and we'll get you those answers. And, uh, and I think what, I, what I'd like to do is, uh, is, is make sure that, that Chris Orwall is involved in, in, in that selection of, of, um, of other folks to distribute this to and, and, uh, and being able to understand what kind of data is being collected. So we'll um, we'll find you those answers and uh, and and get get your committee that help. Kimberly, another did you have another question? I do. I was just saying, like, since our committee, you know, exists and it seems like we need representation on the committee of these various groups and maybe whoever is the representative, whether it's from DCA or from the museum, that you know they're the ones that would sort of identify within their organization like the further distribution um it just seems like maybe uh if we can at least identify who's on our committee um beyond the commission that should be invited to the next meeting so that we can have these conversations um to sort of get the word out as far as surveys and who should be on the list okay so uh, i guess the way what i what I heard in that, um, and it actually points back to um, a standing rule number three that, that governs our, our committees, uh, the subcommittees, it, it's important to just remember that uh, uh, there, there are specific limits on the number of commissioners that are on committees. Committees must be chaired by commissioners, but the membership is not limited to people who are commissioners. And so it's important on these uh, committees that are formed that they bring in uh, folks who are not on the commission that represent those stakeholder organizations to, um, uh, to facilitate getting that perspective. So I, I don't think that, that completely summarizes exactly uh, what, what you said there, uh, Kimberly, but I, 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 I think um, that the key here is making sure that we're engaging properly and getting the right stakeholders identified, but also getting the right people involved who can help us identify the right stakeholders. So there's a sort of there's that nuance there. Okay. Does anyone else have any um, questions or points of discussion on this matter before we move on? Okay, good, good discussion and, and good debate. I, I, these are the kinds of debates I like because it's not crystal clear. This is, this is why we have a commission to talk through these things. So this is, this is good. This is, this is why we're here. All right, um, the, the next item on the agenda, we're gonna move back to item number nine. This is one that I requested, and this is really is a discussion of standing, uh, I'm sorry, a discussion of key decision schedules for the commission. And what, I'm, what I mean by that is I, I wanted uh, uh, specifically uh, Chris Orwall and, and, and Patrick to, um, Patrick Moore to talk a little bit to the commission about uh, some of these major decisions that we have been talking about making, things like establishing a new strategic plan, um, some of the work that may be going on in other committees and the commission and, and just giving some feedback back to the commission about you know, key events that are coming up over the course of say the next year. What is uh, an example question would be, uh, what is the time cycle that, uh, that the state and the museum envision for establishing a strategic plan at, at, at what level and when? I don't need, you know, I don't think we need key dates, but I think putting in perspective uh, the kinds of um, operational challenges that you see on, on the horizon and how we might facilitate helping that along is the type of thing I'm, uh, I'm looking for. I don't know whether, oh, Patrick, looks like you were going to say something. No, yeah, I guess so. Sure, I'll, I'll start off on this one. I think um, 
we don't really have some defined timelines. I think there's appropriateness to move forward on a calculated approach, recognizing that we've been through this last year and it's certainly last year and a half, and it certainly created some slowdowns on areas where we would like to be moving forward and our ability to create um, better flow of information and to collect data and to, to reach some decisions on where we go. And I, I do think Chris brings up some really good points that there are a lot of, there are really a lot of incredible things that this museum has accomplished over the last decade. Um, turn it's really gone in some new exciting directions. You hate to say it's gone in a better direction, but some new directions. That doesn't mean that we don't continue to pivot and evolve. Every museum should that has its viability. With that, I think it really would be ideal. And, and thank you, John, for your repeated um, encouragement for people to come and see the museum, get a tour, really understand where they've come. And, and in that, not just, and, and it's fine to come have a walk around without knowing anybody's there. So you can experience it as a visitor, but also to experience it with, with Chris in hand, with some of his staff to talk about the directions we're going and then to see what some of the planning they have in place is. Uh, I know within historic sites where I am that the planning process and the timeline has very much been dictated by myself and the cabinet secretary and trying to move things forward. And we've helped guide that process uh, from the outset. So in every, every step along the way, as does, as does Billy Garrett, um, thank you, Beth, for pointing him out, uh, over at the History Museum. He, too, has led that process and worked closely with the partner groups. And that means not just the Board of Regents for for our set of museums, uh, but also the New Mexico Museum Foundation. So we know that, uh, I'm assuming that he's, unless he's stepped off, Johnny's still there somewhere, uh, understanding how their role comes in and bringing some of those pieces together. So I think the, the probably the most beneficial step will, how do we, how do we have these conversations actively? How do we work in tandem with it? And, and how do we provide some guidance on your end to work with Chris's schedule and making sure that we're moving things things for, forward incrementally and answering different kinds of questions. Chris, something you'd like to, to add in that to, to build on, or I can move in different directions too. Well, I think, you know, the, 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 one of the things that John wanted to talk about when we we're talking about, you know, kind of the, the decision-making stuff is what decisions does the, the commission need to make on a routine basis, John, I'm just making sure that, this is really kind of what you're looking to address, correct? Well, oh, you're muted, sorry. Sorry, there, there are yeah, two aspects of that. One of them is the, uh, as you said, the, the, the types of decisions that the commission needs to make on a recurrent basis. And number two, there are the kinds of decisions that the commission needs to make on a uh, greatly periodic basis, things that involve strategic planning. I was really focused more on the latter uh, but anything that you uh, can alert us to uh, uh, with respect to the more frequent or recurring decisions is is also helpful too. And let me let me address kind of all of it, you know. So the strategic planning one, I think, is you know, if, if Chris and the committee and I can get together, you know, we put together a timeline last when we did this last time that you know we could probably move elements of that and figure out a new new timeline, and that will determine when the committee is bringing stuff back to the, the whole commission um, for looking at, for approval of different elements as things go along. Um, and it's, it's laid out. It's, it's not a short process if it's done right. Um, you're talking about a nine to 12 month process um, uh, if it's done right with the, with the staffing that we have and the commission members and things like that. Um, uh, so, but, but I think really I, I, I need to work with Chris um, and the committee and see about getting together and, and going over that. And, and that's a step one. And then we, then the rest will lay out um, probably at that near meeting, hopefully um, with the, uh, uh, with the whole commission on how this thing will lay out and, uh, and, and what points will require decisions by the whole um, uh, commission um, for continued guidance as the, as the museum and DCA and then the, the committee go through that process. On a more routine basis, one of the things I wanted to, to address is, and, it, and, and John had asked me the question, uh, it really all goes back to what are the, the statute um, jobs and, and duties of the commission. And, and I'm just gonna, I, what I did with him is I sent it out in an email and it kind of went out, you know, so the first thing was establish museums of space history policy and determine the mission and direction of the development of the museum subject to the approval of the Secretary of Cultural Affairs. 
So most of our policies and procedures all come from DCA, you know, so and, and, and that's where the vast majority of our stuff comes from. There are a couple of exceptions, like our collections policy. Um, is one that was created by um, the uh, uh, by the well actually by the staff and then approved by the uh, by the commission and uh, uh, in that that has decision making points um, for um, for the uh, 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 for the commission and, I, and I'll bring that up because it comes up again a little bit further on so normally what happens is is that new policies that come out from DCA we're just abiding by because that's you know who our who our authority is um, in this. But if the commission wants to create a new policy, they can, but it's got to go through DCA to come down to us in, in that direction. And that happens very infrequently. You know, we review these procedures and policies um, that the commission dealt with, which really is just the collections policy on a relatively infrequent basis. Um, now there's the B is hold title and property for museum use. There's only one time this has ever come up um, uh, for in front of the commission or for DCA since I've been here, and it's right now. Um, it's so so it, this is the first time ever, and probably will be the last time I would expect while I'm here, because although the commission oversees the property, there's no decisions really in that because the property and the pieces of uh, um, the buildings, etc., are it, it, there's no decisions with that one. The, the C, exercise trusteeship over the collections of the museum. This is where the commission um, has a bit more involvement and oversight um, direct and requires deci you know, decisions of some sort. And the, the problem is with the you know, material coming in and out and the way that uh, um, it was worked out in the past, and I can send everybody the, uh, the collections uh, management policy. The way it's set up right now is that the commission has a um, uh, a would have a collection subcommittee and then out of that collection subcommittee one member would be a liaison to the museum's collection committee and so what happens is is when we decide whether or not we're going to um, acquire something we get together and say do we want this you know and kind of a thumbs up and then that liaison is part of that process they're they're one of the voters you know in that in that process um, and then they will you know work with the collections committee that if they sit there and say oh maybe we ought to take a look at collecting some of these things you know or not collecting some of these things they're the ones who kind of work with our curator and myself on that um, but we have a liaison that is actually part of no kidding the hey somebody comes in and says they want to give us x that person would be somebody we would contact at that point in time and say hey you think we should collect x you know so um, and and do that. Um, and that actually is also acquire objects relating to the history of rocketry, spaceflight, astronomy, and related fields of interest, et cetera, et cetera, um, by purchase, donation, or bequest. That fits exactly with the items above as well. And that's why there's also the collections report is included as part of the director's report quarterly um, for that so that the whole commission sees what's coming in and what's going out. Um, the next one is solicit funds for the purpose of developing, restoring, and equipping the museum and its property and for the purchase of objects, et cetera, et cetera. Um, that's the development side. Um, has not been a big thing for the, for the commission in the past. It will be in the future, but it's not something that comes up frequently for decisions because it's based on what's going on in the strategic plan and whether or not we have, whether it is events or things like that. So we would come to the commission and say, hey, we've got an event coming up. What can be done? What can you do, et cetera? Or the commission is helping to decide that we're going to be doing a fundraiser in conjunction with the foundation and the museum um, down the road, et cetera, et cetera. But that comes up very, very infrequently as well. And then F is adopt rules governing the loan of objects and exhibits to qualified institutions. That's where that collections plan and the liaison comes in. Gifts, donations, or loans of exhibit or collection materials for the museum, same. Um, the licensure of the museum's intellectual property. It's not come up since I've been here. We haven't really been putting out intellectual property, but it could happen at some point in time as things continue to, uh, to, to grow and move in the future. G, enter into leases with public or private organizations or agencies for the use of museum premises or facil facilities for periods of time that exceed 45 days. We do all the stuff that's, you know, a, a rental for a night or a week or anything like that. But if we want to rent out property here for more than 45 days, let's say a restaurant wanted to come up here, that would require the commission to step in and decide uh, on that based on the recommendation of the, uh, of the staff. 
um, cooperate with other agencies and political subdivisions of state, tribal, and federal governments and private organizations and individuals to the extent necessary to establish and maintain the museum and its programs. That's basically, um, uh, you know, overseeing what we're doing in the strategic plan and our operations and making sure that we're doing what is in the plan um, uh, that, that has been created. Um, and so decisions, not so much. It's really just making sure we're doing what you told us to do in the strategic plan and what DCA expects us to do in that plan as well. Um, and then subject to other provisions of law and accepting temporary statewide initiatives of the Secretary of Cultural Affairs, impose admission fees to the museum facilities and programs. This is one that comes up rel relatively frequently. If we want to change the prices at the museum, that has to be approved by the commission. We have to bring that before the commission for approval. Now we can offer a discount. You know, if we want to give somebody 5% off because it's space day, we can do those sort of things. But if we're changing our prices, we want to go from $5 to $7.50 for admission or start charging instead of $6 for, for a movie, we want to charge $8. All of those price changes are brought before the uh, commission, and we generally do that once a year, unless there's an emergency. Um, generally, we do it once a year, and we do it at the, at, at the, uh, in the October meeting so that we could implement new prices in January if it's appropriate. Uh, and then the last item is review annually the performance of the director and report its findings to the Secretary of Cultural Affairs. Let me just say jokingly. I've been here nine years. I've never had my performance reviewed. <laughs> so in any case, that's one that the commission is supposed to do as well as provide uh, feedback on the, on the director's uh, um, uh, performance. So that's kind of the decision things that come up. As you can see, statutorily, there's not a significant number of things that come up routinely with the exception of the collections and the pricing. Um, and then the rest of it really is oversight, making sure that we're doing what we're supposed to be doing and 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 then really truly assisting to to make sure that using the connections that you have to help spread the word and help you know market and fundraise and other things like that um with with respect to uh key decisions in the short term and i i guess i'm i'm thinking specifically of the of the strategic plan uh is there a a, a general guidance that uh, you and and Patrick would have on when when you would like to have a, a a new strategic plan you know in place and operational um, and again I, I don't need a hard answer but are you talking about uh, well if we had that done by you know by next summer that would be good what what kind of a ballpark are you thinking about in that in that context I think from the DCA end sort of in, in contrast where you've had absent uh, COVID, but indeed during that time, usually a, um, a nine month kind of time window is usually appropriate. So to target on working your way incrementally toward that um, calculated for the for the next calendar year would make sense, Chris. Yeah, yeah and that's, that's what I agree. I said the process normally takes nine to 12 months from that first step of um, sitting down and, and, and A, just figuring out what the process is, and then starting the stakeholder identification, the clock kind of starts from there. So if we start that up within the next month um, to two months, really at the most, um, you know, just do the math from there, adding nine months, you know, so let's say we get the process started in, I'll say September. Um, so, you know, just because it's easier to work in quarters, you know, so the ninth month, you know, so we'd be looking um, uh, into the into the early summer of next year. And that that's fine for the museum because we can continue operating on the one we've got. It goes through 2022. 20, um, um, uh, we can make changes to the one that's existing right now as well. It, it, you know, there are, you can make tweaks to that to hold over as we're going towards the creation of the next one. We wanted to have it going now, but COVID um, uh, was the, you know, just stopped all of that discussion. We would have been implementing it now um, was the plan so that it was a year before the other one ended, but life happened. Okay. So. Yeah, that was that was one of the one of the uh, things I was looking for in that discussion, and I think that helps frame some of the activities that the commission needs to calibrate itself to as as committees do their work and gather information. So I, I think that's helpful. Beth, a question? Yeah, I have a question for um, Patrick Moore. Um, in the past, have the um, the strategic plans uh, been written in-house by each museum, 
or have they involved outside consultants to help uh, create plans for other other facilities? Um, we've had a mix in that. An excellent question. Thank you, Commissioner. Um, for instance, the in Museum of International Folk Art uh, recently hired Lord Cultural Resources uh, to to help oversee those. Uh, by contrast, Billy Garrett primarily did it in-house and worked in conjunction with his own staff. So there's not really a right or wrong uh, answer to that one. So either of them are viable approaches. Thanks for the question. Any other questions or comments on, on this item? Yeah, you know, I, I hope the discussion was informative. I, I got a couple things out of it myself and I appreciate the, the time. I know this has been another one of these meetings which is longer than y'all wanna be sitting here. We still have a few more things to get through. Um, I apologize for that, but I knew this would be a long meeting today. All right, if there are no more discussions on that, we'll move on. Um, I think we can actually get through the next agenda item relatively quickly. Uh, it has four subparts, but uh, they're, they're not particularly, they don't necessarily need to be very long. And that's specifically on um, uh, discussing the uh, standing committees uh, and, and some selection of members. And I, I want, what I want to do is uh, specifically talk through a couple of these items. I don't think we, there's much discussion left to have right now on aligning uh, item A, which is aligning the committee's work with key, the key decision schedule. Uh, we we kind of took care of that in the process. And, um, and, and so we'll have more discussion on that within the committees. Um, one of the things I brought up, moving on to item B, uh, during the last commission meeting uh, was uh, uh, membership and leadership on, on committees. And uh, we had uh, a couple of uh, sessions ago selected the, 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 the chair of the um, uh, Mission and Strategic Planning Committee. And uh, there was, a, it was an open question at the point about uh, uh, who would uh, the other existing committee that we have right now is the Development Committee. Uh, and, and also the, um, we also have uh, a legislative uh, support committee, uh, which, which hasn't necessarily needed to be active because there hasn't been a legislature in session for anyone to go visit. Um, but with respect to the development committee, I believe that committee has had one or two meetings in the interim. Is that, is that true? John, we had a meeting in the interim. Uh, I got it organized and then Rhonda graciously stepped forward to become the chair. So I turned the meeting over to her. Oh, very good. Uh, Commissioner Cross, are you uh, amenable to chairing the development committee? Don't see her on anymore. We lost Rhonda a little while ago. Ah, yes, we did. Well, um, she may be having the same difficulties I had for about 20 minutes. Yeah. Okay, well, um, I, we, may, we may have to table that if she doesn't come back, um, but uh, if she has graciously uh, agreed to step up and do that, uh, that would, she would certainly have my full support. And uh, I know that uh, from the, from the you know, perspective of her being a, uh, a, a leader in the community in Alamogordo, that is also very advantageous for, for uh, uh, attending foundation uh, meetings. So I would, I'd, I would be very pleased with uh, supporting that nomination. Uh, we, we will um, pick that up when she is present uh, to defend herself if she chooses to do so. <laughs> I still think, John, we can vote her in even if she is not present. I think if, legally if we can. Agree. I think <laughs> legally we can do that. I, yes. <laughs> I would feel bad about doing that to somebody. I've had it done to me. Uh, you can always call her on the phone. <laughs> yes. Well, and again, there's no urgency to that item, so uh, we will we will table that, and I'll communicate with her um, offline and, and let her know our intentions. But um, um, is, uh, since we are uh, all talking about that, are there any um, other nominations for uh, leading that that committee? Hearing none, which I suspected. Um, We'll bring that up uh, at the next the next time uh, 
uh, Commissioner Cross is available should she want to say something about it and accept that nomination and we'll put that to a vote. Uh, next item on the agenda there is the establishment of the Education Committee. A, a lot of uh, outreach and educational activities uh, have, have you know, been at a complete standstill over the past year. Uh, the Education Committee is, is an established uh, uh, entity under Standing Rule 9 of, of, the, of the Commission. So uh, we, we already have a description of that. And, uh, and what, what I would like to do is, uh, is um, nominate Commissioner Fahey to uh, stand up that committee and um, to take the lead initially in doing that. And um, um, would you have any objection to doing that, Kimberly? No, I accept. And uh, you, do you have any any uh, any ideas or things you'd like to say? We can we can certainly table that uh, discussion if we need to. Um, I would be interested. Uh, one thing is uh, to ask if there are other members of the commission who would be interested in participating in that committee before we come looking for you to recruit you. I definitely need other people on the committee, so. You, you certainly do. <laughs> well, we'll, we will Pencil me in. This is Paolo. Awesome. Thank you, Paolo. Thank you, Paolo. Uh, I, I guess know guys... Kim, is, Kim is awesome, <laughs> so I would love to be there. Thanks. Thank you. Carlos, yes, I would. Kimberly, if you don't mind having a former high school teacher on your pan your committee, I'd love to serve. Oh, that'd be awesome. Thank you. I would like to serve, too, if possible. That's that's four. Thank All you, right. Carlos. So good. Um, yeah. I guess I'll just ask if anybody has like what was done in the past. I'll be open to at least find out. And I guess from the museum as well, like what are some of the sort of existing programs so we have awareness of what you guys are planning on doing just so we know how we can best support. I think this is a, and an also a, it's important that in this case, um, um, obviously we have to do some recruiting here, but uh, uh, you, the director of education at the museum should be a member of that committee. Um, yeah, uh, Chris. Any any other uh, person that you think is appropriate? Uh, this is one of the most important activities that uh, I think that the museum participates in is education and outreach, uh, especially with respect to students. Um, so the the more contacts and help uh, that we can bring in terms of enabling uh, the the mission of the museum, the, I think the better. Thank you. And, and, Two people would be our education director and our outreach coordinator. Um, so Dave Dooling is the education director and then Tony Gondola is our outreach coordinator. So in keeping, you know, we'll uh, keeping them uh, as members of committees for all the discussions and everything is primo. Good. If you, if, if you, uh, by virtue of you being their boss can assign them to that committee, we will take that and add them and they will be on the committee. All right. Uh, any other uh, any other discussion of that? This is Jacqueline um, Fryer. Did you hear me say that I'd like to be on that committee? I'm having oh, trouble did. with internet and everything going on right now. We're having a big thunderstorm in my community. Oh no, I did not hear that. Uh, yeah. but I think that is uh, perfectly appropriate, and that is okay, five commissioners, okay. and that is mm -hmm. that is the maximum number of commissioners we can have on on any committee. Perfect. So that's good. And anyone else we add will will need to not be a commissioner. So, Kimberly, you have a you have a full uh, a full committee there, and that's uh, good. And now I'm not so nervous. <laughs> and so. You, you span the state too. You've got <laughs> folks from every corner of the state here. So, you know, that works. North, central, south, east, and west. So, do we need representation from DCA? Patrick, is there an interest in uh, having somebody on the uh, education committee? Well, technically, everybody who is on Chris's staff is DCA. So he relays that, and, and I think we'll leave that to him. If he thinks it's appropriate, we could certainly do it. But okay. we're all a DCA family. One DCA. One of the, uh, I mean, one of, one, of I, one of the jobs I think that, uh, uh, that this commi committee especially will be doing is, is, is doing a lot of coordination and outreach. 
uh, because the more more folks you can get involved with education and outreach, the better. And um, I, I, for one, have a, a great interest in that. So thank, thank you for that. Um, I, I believe at uh, what we generally do with um, accepting a chair for a committee, please correct me if I'm wrong, Valerie, is that is something that we vote on as a commission? Is that correct? Um, it can be appointed, I believe, or you can vote. It is your choice. Oh, well, it, it, in, oh, in last time. by means of expediency, if there are no objections, I will make the appointment of, of Commissioner Fahey as chair of the Education Commission. If there are no objections, we will not put it to a vote. Very good. We can move on. Okay, the collections committee. There is not a collections committee, uh, as uh, as Chris said earlier. Um, uh, collections committee has existed in the past. It is not governed by a standing rule, um, and so um, I, I have a, a proposal uh, for um, a motion to establish the collections committee. And uh, if if. If there are no objections, I'd like to make that motion so that we can discuss it. Second. Okay, so I my motion is that uh, the commission establishes, essentially it, it is reestablishing it, but is really is establishing the collections committee, which will consist of the, uh, the director, the curator, the assistant director, and up to three commissioners uh, from the commission. The purpose of this committee is to give an advice and consent for acquisitions, um, deaccessions, loans uh, made to and by the museum. Um, and, and this committee will be able to codify its own process for efficiently deciding uh, such matters. And uh, those should be presented back to the commission as a new standing rule uh, at some future meeting. So if we can uh, ask some folks to uh, self-assemble as, uh, as a committee who will then work together to establish the rules of operation and engagement. And at some future time when you're ready, bring those back to the, to the commission. Um, We'll, uh, we'll give you the seal of approval on that. And I think because it's a great way for the commission to get involved with, with the museum and its mission and, and can be very supportive uh, to, uh, to the museum, uh, it's worth uh, writing that down as a new standing rule and establishing that uh, committee with its, um, uh, with its uh, chartered uh, rules of operation. Any, any discussion on that motion? Beth? Yeah, I have a question. Um, what part of the budget does the collections uh, department receive in terms of, not of maybe dollars, but in terms of percentage from the museum budget? Varies year to year um, uh, uh, because it depends on what we may be installing what artifacts we're acquiring, um, you know, the, 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 there's not a set amount because the personnel are already paid for through the state. So I could, you know, I could give you those numbers, but I'd give them to you offline kind of thing. Um, uh, as far as, as far as that, and, and there's no set amount for um, acquisition or equipment, same as everything else. It's as funds come available from the state um, for doing improvements in the, uh, in the collections rooms. And how much uh, grant writing is done and, and uh, outside donors and, and uh, you know, funding from outside sources from the state? The, uh, the, the, we, we have done a couple of grants. Sue just got one, um, right. a, a micro grant. Um, uh, um, but we don't have, we have not, had, we've been trying to hire, <laughs> Patrick can attest to this one. We've been hire, trying to hire a development coordinator on our staff for almost a decade now. Um, uh, in any case, though, um, uh, to, to free up the, the ability to write uh, grants and the, the foundation, um, uh, as you know, like Museum of New Mexico um, Foundation does a lot of grant writing 
Um, ours has not um, to date. Um, uh, and that's less active foundation. It's becoming more active now um, is the difference there. So there was not the, the personnel with the time available um, to, do, to do much grant writing for, uh, uh, for, the, for anything here um, across the board. It's not just collections either. That's, that's, that's for education programs, et cetera. So I think there's a, there's a lot of opportunity there to um, help with facilitating the path forward between the, the state the museum, the foundation, uh, and perhaps grant writing. And as a, a development director um, comes on board someday, um, uh, you know, there, there's a lot of opportunity there, and, um, and we can help with that. So uh, are, is, are there any uh, commissioners who are particularly interested in uh, joining the collections committee? Beth? I, in fact, would sign myself up to be a member of the collections committee. I will not chair it, <laughs> but um, I, I will be happy to, to participate in that and uh, in, in helping to put together some rules and, and uh, there's sort of room for one more under the proposal. Hey, can, I, can I ask a question? When you talk about putting together rules, we already have a collections plan. Not, no, I don't, I'm not necessarily talking about that. I'm talking about the rules of engagement for the committee, what, okay. what specifically the committee does and how it functions and interacts to support the museum's plan. Because one, one of the things that we will need in the near term is who's that liaison um, which individual from the collections committee will be that liaison that we will be getting in touch with when we're looking to collect an object or or deaccess an object? Yeah, and I, I think that's something that we can work out with within that committee and decide who how we want to do that. Since the rules have not been written or adopted, I think there's a lot of flexibility there uh, in just discussing how we want to do that. I don't th see this as an urgency, but th those uh, folks who sign up for that. Uh, should get together with with yourself, uh, the curator, the assistant curator, and talk through what we think a process is that's supportive of that. And we'll come to a decision and write it up and bring it back to the commission for adoption. I think it's I think it's a fun way to be involved. Very. So do we, do we, need, we need one more pony at the show or or what? No, we don't don't necessarily need one more. I'm there's room for one more. <laughs> How about and, Bryce? Are you interested or James? That's not recruiting. not particularly <laughs> yeah, putting people on the spot. We can we can always add somebody. If there's not an interest immediately, so that's OK. We'll, we'll yeah, show I would, like to, I would like to. If you don't need to do it today, I would like to wait, wait, wait a month and think about it more. Unless if it's not something that has to be finalized in today's meeting. Nope, it does not. We'll pull you into some discussions and see if you're interested and yeah. if it works. I know I know you have a new job now. <laughs> Congratulations, by the way. Okay. Um, I don't think uh, we see we question for for Valerie Joe. We, do we need to uh, vote on? on my motion or do we just wait until the the draft rule comes forward to codify that uh, well it's not a it's not sorry it's not a draft rule um i think you should vote to create the committee and for the um right now there are two members on that committee um or two people who will start um, coming up along with the staff of the museum to try to figure out what the standing committee, um, what's it called, standing rule would be. Okay, so we'll we'll vote on the, on the motion which I read in earlier, which is the establishment of the committee, uh, and that we will bring back uh, the rules uh, in uh, the rules of engagement in the form of a standing rule at a future commission meeting. So yes, I, 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 I so move that. I, I second, second that motion. Yeah, seconded. Right. Let's do a roll, roll call vote on this. Um, 
Commissioner Churchill, I think he might have had to leave. Uh, Commissioner Cross, maybe maybe we lost her earlier. That's right. Uh, Commissioner Elder, I vote aye. Commissioner Fahey, I vote aye. Commissioner Fryer, aye. Commissioner Martinez, aye. Commissioner McAteer, aye. Commissioner O'Leary. Aye. Commissioner Omeg. Uh, aye. Commissioner Tappan. Aye. And I vote aye. So the motion carries. Thank you for that. And uh, let's see. No further discussion. Sure. Yes. Chair mem and members of the commission, I just wanted to, um, before we leave this topic, I know there was a question from the last meeting um, about whether or not standing uh, rule number eight and nine had been adopted by the commission. Um, thank you to um, Chris Orwell for providing the information with the minutes that on April 30th of 2010, both of those um, standing rules eight for the mission and long-term planning um, committee, as well as um, the standing rule nine for the education um, committee, they had both passed by the commission. Um, so I believe the copies that you all had, they said draft, but that was a, an error on the document. Thank you all so right. much. Thank, thank you for clarifying that, Valerie. That, that's helpful. Thank you. Okay, uh, moving on. Uh, the, the other committee report that we... Uh, uh, actually, it's in line now on the agenda is uh, anything from the development committee. And I know we don't have Commissioner Cross here today. Uh, Don, you said that you did meet. Yes, we did. And basically, it was just an informational. I was trying to explain to Rhonda and Carlos what the committee did. Okay. So I understand there's no no developments to report other, other than the... Uh, uh, the, uh, the recommendation to uh, approve Commissioner Cross as the chair, which I we will do next time around when we get her back to have her in the room for that. Any other questions on the development committee? Thank you. Okay, um, the next item, item 12, uh, I'm gonna ask, um, uh, Valerie Joe to walk us through that is approval of the acceptance of the quit claim deed uh, for the Clyde Tombaugh Space Instruction Center. So we are buying a piece of property. Right. And I believe Chris Orwell probably has more information about it, but I did review the document. I don't see any problems with it. Um, Chris, if you could just, I guess, explain it more. I think you've talked about this in the past, but yes. I don't have all the context. So the process which has been going on for quite a while. Um, I'll just leave it at that. We're, we're coming up on, I think, Patrick, are we two and a half years into this process now? Yeah, it's been a while. Um, in any case, though, the, what had to happen is that when they built the, the, the facility up here, um, the land, most of the land uh, was turned over to the Office of Cultural Affairs at that point in time, Department of Cultural Affairs. Um, but then the university, um, uh, the NMSU, and the Office of Cultural Affairs, now Department of Cultural Affairs, came to an agreement to build the Tombaugh building, but the university was building it. It was built with joint funds, but the university was building it, and the university owned it, although it was a joint use um, facility. So what is, you know, what's happening now, you know, the piece of land, though, we still owned, but not all of it. You know, interestingly enough, we actually have a little tiny corner of our parking lot that we don't own um, uh, still. Um, it's just one of those strange little quirks of the way the land lines go through and, and BLM land and university land, et cetera. That being said, um, the university wanted to turn over the Tombaugh building in its entirety to the Department of Cultural Affairs. We have wanted it for forever. They have been turning over portions of it the operations of the interior to the museum for forever. When it first started, we operated the, the theater and that was it. They used the classrooms and offices and the laboratory around the outer edge. And then one of the classrooms was turned over to DCA. Then the office spaces were turned over to DCA. Then the other classroom was turned over to DCA, two other offices to DCA. The only thing left that the university was operating was the laboratory, a storage room and two offices adjacent to that. 
everything else was being utilized by DCA. And as the years went by, the utilities changed, et cetera, et cetera. So the university finally made the decision um, here uh, recently um, to turn over the, um, the building in its entirety to the Department of Cultural Affairs. So we will be operating it um, uh, entirely. The process for that is, is that the, the Department of Cultural Affairs needed to write a letter to the, uh, the New Mexico State University region saying, yes, we would be interested in accepting the, music, the, the building. Then the regions had to go through the process of essentially doing a quick claim deed to turn the, the property uh, and the, music, the, the building over to the Department of Cultural Affairs. Um, and in addition, we had to do an acceptance letter and I've got all those. If you ever want to see them, I can email them out. Um, and then the last part of the process is that the Department of Cultural Affairs um, doesn't own the property uh, for the stuff here at the New Mexico's um, Museum of Space History. That is the governor's commission. And so they need to do a quick claim deed to turn it over to the, uh, uh, to the governor's commission um, for oversight, just as you oversee um, a slash own um, all of the rest of the property and buildings on the campus um, already. This just adds one more. And so that's what it is. Now there's two provisions um, that were part of this. Um, and and the, the Department of Cultural Affairs, we completely agree um, with both of these. Um, one of them is that uh, we're not allowed to change the name of the building without going back to NMSU to ask permission to change the name of the building away from the Tombaugh um, education uh, building. We completely agree with that one. We want it to be named Tombaugh. That's, we want that. Um, uh, that makes complete and total sense. There's a reason why our theater is the New Horizons Theater. Um, uh, in any case, the second thing was from the BLM, actually, and that is because it's on what used to be BLM land, if we ever stop using it as an educational and outreach facility, so we stop it being a theater and classroom and everything else, um, and want to turn it into a non-museum building, BLM wants the land back. So in other words, if for some reason we want to turn it into a restaurant, BLM wants the land back. Um, so. We don't have any issue with that either. We don't plan on converting the nice theater and education spaces into a restaurant or anything like that anytime in the near future. Um, so the board's voting on the acceptance of the quick claim approval. And then we confirm that the regents have um, filed their quick claim, turning it over to the Department of Cultural Affairs. As soon as we 100% confirm that, then we put this one into the county. Uh, and then all of the property and the buildings on our campus are all under the control of the governor's commission, as opposed to most everything except for the Tombaugh building right now. Thank you, Chris. Um, I, I have one question. Well, two questions, I guess. I, I believe I know the answers to these. I, I, am, I would assume that there are no significant liabilities or uh, environmental problems that come with this building or land. DCA, no. had a, DCA had us take a look into that. Um, there's there's no storage of fluids. There's no um, equipment failures that you know we we went through and took a look at the entire history of the building, the makeup of it. We've you know verified um, asbestos loading if there was any you know that, yeah none of none of that. Okay, thank you. Any other questions, uh, Commissioner Fahey? I was just wondering, is this different classrooms than what you showed a picture of at the beginning of this meeting? Uh, no, one of those classrooms is in that building. Um, that that uh, uh, used to be in, up until very recently was a storage room. Um, now it's a it's becoming a classroom. Um, uh, but there are there are actually when you there were four classrooms and a laboratory classroom. What's what we have now is we have a front classroom. The other classroom that's in the front of the building has been turned into our printing area and we're about to build a new um, uh, recording studio in there for that online outreach. Um, that's a new thing coming. Um, then the back classrooms, one of them long ago was converted over to office spaces and the other one is still an operating classroom. And then the laboratory classroom is a laboratory classroom. I showed you the picture of that one. Okay. Uh um, just a quick question, maybe for Valerie or Chris. Um, does uh, approval of this quit claim deed um, in any way inhibit future construction or 
uh, having the Tomba uh, facility expand uh, still as an educational facility or, or serve the museum purposes. I don't know if Valerie have an answer, but, but as far as we understood in our discussions with NMSU, no, because we did ask that question. Doesn't sound like that was included in the provision. There's no restriction against it in the quit claim that went to DCA. So, um, uh, and we just confirmed that we could make changes to the building as long as we didn't change the name of the building. Right, and in the document I'm reviewing, it, it just has the revisionary um, purpose for BLM. So as long as it's still education and stuff, it doesn't seem to be any restriction on expansion. Okay, thank you. We, we have questions or wanted to know that because we have significant plans for the back of that building. <laughs> Any other questions or discussions on the acquisition of the Clyde Tombaugh building? John, I'll make a motion that we approve. I second it. So seconded. We'll take a roll call vote. The issue is uh, approval of the acceptance of a quick claim deed from the Department of Cultural Affairs for the Clyde W. Tombaugh Space Instruction Center. I believe Commissioner Churchill is absent. Uh, do we have Commissioner Cross back online? No, we don't. We do not. Uh, Commissioner Elder? Aye. Commissioner Fahey? Aye. Commissioner Fryer? Aye. Commissioner Martinez? I approve. Commissioner McAteer? Aye. Commissioner O'Leary? Aye. Commissioner Omeg? Aye. Commissioner Tappan? Aye. And I vote aye. Congratulations, we now have a new building. I've wanted that for nine years. <laughs> well, there you go. Okay, uh, let's see. Um, coming to the home stretch here, thank you all for sticking with this. Uh, any announcements that need to uh, be part of the minutes of the commission today? All right, hearing none, move to uh, acceptance of the dates of upcoming meetings. Uh, currently, we have on our schedule, as I said, a meeting August 27th, which is six weeks from today. Um, I, I think that is a fine date, and I am hoping that that meeting takes place uh, at the museum and is uh, possibly accompanied by a uh, tour of the facilities so it may may take a few extra hours and it, no, normally with the delay of this meeting i would have recommended moving it back but because we have not been able to have an in-person meeting uh, although i don't know that there will be a lot of decision making to do at that meeting getting everybody together to get a chance to see the facilities and everything tour around um i, I think far outweighs um, uh, the, the, the nearness and new, you know, closeness of the meetings and would recommend that we can continue that one. And we are supposed to be able to, uh, um, uh, have, have everybody up here. I concur with that. I, I think the earlier we can get everyone to Alamogordo, the better and uh, a short business meeting with a lot of time spent getting to know each other and the facilities and the staff is the, exactly what we need at this point. So. Uh, we also have uh, meetings currently scheduled on October 29th and January 28th. I, I see no reason to uh, adjust those at this point unless there are any um, specific reasons we should look to change the dates of those meetings. John, I would also like to um, make sure that uh, whatever, wherever we have the meetings, uh, that the subcommittees also give a, have a chance to participate as subcommittees. Yeah, there, there will certainly be, um, uh, so I guess let me just to clarify your question, uh, Beth, uh, the reports from the subcommittees will be a part of the standing agenda, but are you specifically uh, talking about allowing some time during that day that folks are at the museum to allow those committees to meet independently? Is that, is that what you're talking about? Yeah, I think that would be very useful. Since okay. We since we haven't met in person, and, and maybe we will or maybe we won't, but that time is set aside because I, I found in working with subcommittees, it's, it's hard enough to get us all together, you know. Yeah, I, 
And I think that that's, I think there's a perfectly reasonable thing to ask the committees to self-organize around as uh, we get closer to that date and find out uh, exactly when and where we will meet and what our agenda is for that in-person day. Uh, what we can do is uh, see that we have uh, perhaps uh, an hour or, or whatever time we need allocated ahead of time outside of the agenda for the commission, specifically allowing that time for the committees to meet, and then they can deliver their reports to the full commission at the public meeting. Yep. Thank you. No, oh, that's a good suggestion, Beth. Thank you. We'll, we'll do that when we put the agenda together for that day. Okay. Uh, do we need to vote on those dates or is that just informational? Traditionally, it was just informational, um, uh, but if, if you vote on it, um, then it actually is published out and the, you kind of already announced the meetings, so. In that I, case, I'll move we approve the, uh, the schedule. Yeah, let's do that. I second the motion. Uh, Commissioner Elder. Aye. Commissioner Fahey. Aye. Commissioner Fryer. I, I do have a problem with August 27th. That's our county fair. So I won't be able to go to that meeting. I'm in charge of a bunch of things at the fair. Oh, that, that is important. <laughs> regrettable, but I understand. We'll, we'll yeah. Yeah. Anyway, yeah. I'm, different yeah. Yes. All right. Thank you. Uh -huh. uh, Commissioner Martinez. Aye. Commissioner McAteer. Aye. Commissioner O'Leary. Aye. Commissioner Omeg. Aye. Commissioner Tappan. Aye. I vote aye. Uh, there being no other business and- Chair, we'll may I ask a question? This is Valerie Joe. Um, I'm just wondering in case anyone is, you know, last minute life happens um, and a commissioner is unable to make it um, or staff is unable to make it via in person, is there, would they call in? Is there gonna be some sort of virtual option available for those? We've traditionally set it up where people, if they, and it's been optional. Um, uh, in the past, th this is the first time that we've done this where Zoom has been more prevalent. In the past, we just had a, uh, a oh, yeah. phone um, that we had available if people wanted to, to call in. And we only, Don, correct me if I'm wrong, I think we did that twice, maybe three times. Mm -hmm. Yes. Nine yes. years in here. A lot of times it was just people mm -hmm. said, I'm not going to be there. And, you know, they, weren't there in any way, shape, or form. So, so I guess the answer is there, 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 there it has been and will be some way to call in, and it's probably going to be just as easy for Warren to set a laptop up on the table and folks can Zoom in. So we'll, we will have a provision for that. Okay, sounds good. Any other questions or comments? Uh, Kimberly, you have, have a question? Uh yeah, I was just curious uh, for Chris, um, how did the 4th of July go? Was that your main event this month? Yeah. <laughs> Johnny may want to step in on this discussion, but the bottom line being is that this year the fireworks were launched um, down the hill at um, the, the Griggs Park, the, the area adjacent to Griggs Park. Uh, and the city did a big event, uh, and that's because the foundation was trying to organize an event, um, and there was confusion as to uh, uh, launch sites, et cetera. So we already have started the discussions. I mean, literally a week ago, we started the discussions for 2022 um, uh, to get the MOA uh, all set up for launching up here at the museum. And uh, um, the, you know, the city does not want to do an event on July 4th. They actually want to do one Labor Day. Um, they want to leave the July 4th one open up for us. So at, it launched in town and that has gotten mixed reviews um, as far as a launch site. Um, there was a few people who said they really liked it um, down there, but the vast majority have said they did not like it because they could not see it. Um, and so uh, that's, it's, it's coming back. It's coming back home. Thank you, Chris. Any other questions or comments today? Uh, yeah, I'll oh, jump in you. and just follow up with Chris on, on that. Uh, uh, yeah, we're looking for the, the, the city kind of had an event and, and their current launch site will also point out next year becomes a school. 
So this kind of really became their, their only opportunity for a one-off launch site. And as Chris said, it's very mixed reviews and, and, and everything that we, we're getting indicated back is we're going to launch from the museum again next year. Very good. Right, and just I wanted to confirm that I know that this meeting is usually broadcast on the YouTube channel. That would continue even though there's an in-person meeting, or it would not. It un unless it was electronic, it would not. We never had in the past. Um, uh, it was never broadcast before. Um, that's only been as we've been doing Zoom meetings. Um, so this is kind of been a COVID sort of thing. Now, if somebody was zooming, I mean that. that that's something I think I need to talk to you about, you know, completely separately because rules have changed in the last 14 months quite significantly. So I don't know if we just go to an in-person meeting, do we need to broadcast it? I don't know that there's a requirement for that. Well, I'm not sure there's a requirement, but I think the public has become used to, and if they've been watching it, you know, it's something for the, the commission to consider perhaps, perhaps something they would like to provide guidance to, you know, everyone else on. Yeah, let's take a look at the, uh, how many folks have been tuning into this uh, before the next meeting? And we'll make, a, you know, we'll, we'll go with uh, whatever I think is uh, most convenient for both the commission and the, and the viewing public. And we'll sort that out ahead of time. I appreciate that. Any other uh, comments or questions for today? I'll move we adjourn. I will second the motion and uh, that the meeting is adjourned. Thank you all. Thank you for your time today. Thank you all. Take care. Bye. Thanks a lot. Bye, everyone. Thanks, everyone. <laughs>